on your Daily Detroit for Wednesday, February 21st, 2024, we're going to talk about a new approach to attainable housing. As you know, housing prices have been skyrocketing in the city, the region, and the state. In fact, area housing prices rose faster than anywhere else in the country. That's putting the idea of owning a home out of reach for many, and maybe we need to look at some new ways of tackling the problem. That's where a new program, Tomorrow's Housing Innovation Showcase, or this, might come in. In partnership between the Gilbert Family Foundation and the North Corktown Neighborhood Association, they're trying something a bit different, and I'm going to talk with Darnell Adams of the Gilbert Family Foundation about it. I'm Jer Stays. Let's pay a bill and get right into that conversation. Does your financial advisor take the time to really listen to you? Is your financial strategy personalized to you and your family? Will your financial advisor be there as your life and financial situation change? Hi, I'm Jerry Mangona, your Edward Jones financial advisor. I live here in Corktown, just a few blocks from the Daily Detroit studios. And when we work together, we'll focus on what's important to you. We'll use an established process to create a personalized financial strategy backed by the advice, tools, and resources to help you reach your goals. And we'll partner together to help your strategy stay on track. Contact me toll-free today at 866-975-8655. Again, that's 866-975-8655. Edward Jones, member SIPC. Joining me across the table at Tech Town, Darnell Adams. He's the vice president of Detroit Community Initiatives at the Gilbert Foundation. Darnell, welcome to Daily Detroit. Thank you for having me. My pleasure. I am excited to have this conversation. There are some interesting news bits to talk about that impact Detroit neighborhoods directly, and a neighborhood that's near and dear to my heart as well. But before we get into it, I think a lot of people are like, Gilbert Foundation, you know, Dan Gilbert's charitable stuff. But let's go beyond that and give people a thumbnail sketch real quick. Kind of what are the goals of the Gilbert Foundation so people get a, a fuller picture. The Gilbert Family Foundation was started in 2015 with the goal of finding a cure for neurofibromatosis, which Dan and Jennifer's son, Nick Gilbert, suffered from before passing in May of 2023. And that is still true today. We are still actively working towards finding that cure, and we will because we believe we will. And in 2021, Dan and Jennifer decided to gift a $500 million commitment to Detroit, which stood up the Detroit Community Initiatives pillar within the foundation. So now we have a NF pillar and we have a Detroit Community Initiatives pillar. And the Detroit Community Initiatives pillar is really focused on improving income growth and stability for Detroiters through economic mobility, also housing stability through home ownership, and then also social strengthening of the infrastructure of neighborhoods. So making sure that neighborhoods have strong social fabric and infrastructure. I will say it's pretty common that these foundations have multiple goals. That's part of endowing them and, and giving them the ability to do more. I think those goals are interesting to me because it's more about addressing the root causes of some of these issues that Detroit faces as opposed to kind of, you know, it's great to build buildings. It's great to put in new apartments. It's great to do those things. But underneath with what's happening in the city of Detroit, there's so much more that needs to be addressed. That's right. When you think about housing stability, it's great that, you know, we've launched programs such as the Detroit Tax Relief Fund to make sure that if a resident qualifies for the city's property tax exemption program, their HOPE program, where they pay none or some property taxes, that not only are they getting those types of resources and being stable in their home, but their neighborhood is also receiving some public life investment so that not only is that home being stabilized, but the entire environment that they live in is also being stabilized at the same time. One of the things that can be very difficult about living in areas of poverty is just the lack of other resources. The things that when you go see another neighborhood or you go see another place that are just there that in some cases Detroit lacks or Detroit needs reinforcement on. So I'm glad to hear that there's more than just the home. It's like we're going to look at the neighborhood and, and do something with that. Right. And, and it's not us doing it alone. We bring really strong partners who are at the grassroots level, a lot of CDOs across the city who are already doing this work. What we're doing is working with them to scale that impact in those neighborhoods. Community development organizations That's for right. those who Thank for you. those who uh, don't know. So let's get into this project in North Corktown. And very interesting to me. Housing affordability is this challenge that is 
kind of bedeviling Detroit. You know, I've been in the city for a long time and I feel like it went to warp speed. I feel like there was one day where like I literally interviewed somebody who bought a thousand dollar or five hundred dollar house. And then I woke up one morning and it's like four hundred twenty five thousand dollar for a one bedroom closet. And I'm like, what happened in the middle here? Yeah. And uh, I know there's obviously a lot of forces at play. And, and to be fair, a number of those forces are not d- about Detroit. I mean, we went through the pandemic. We've dealt with interest rates. We've dealt with a lot of things, uh, housing availability, all that other stuff. So let's talk about this project that is aimed at it. Because so often I see the solution that is presented about affordability to be apartments. And this is not that. No, this is not that at all. This is really refocusing on that American dream that so many people have still about owning that first home uh, for their family and for themselves. We recognize that most Americans built wealth from that asset that they have. And it's a bit out of reach these days. The national average used to be $234,000 for a new home, but now it's about $350,000 for a new home, uh, for a starter home nationally. Obviously that's not applicable to Detroit, but it just shows you that at a national scale, this is becoming more out of reach for many Americans. Mm -hmm. And with interest rates being what they are, we're talking about at least $1,000 more for that same house for that mortgage note, which makes it really hard to afford. And that also ties into people's sense of well-being. You know, It's something where I talk to younger listeners. You know, I, I moved out on my own when I was like 19, 20 years old, right? Like almost right away. I know a lot of younger listeners that are like, I'm never going to own a place or they're still with their parents into their late 20s. Like there is this real frustration. It's not that people don't want to in a lot of cases. It's that the cost doesn't line up with what they make or, or things like that. And I think there needs to be some real solutions around this because this problem, if we leave it alone, won't go away. That's right. This happened during World War II uh, and it's happening again. There's a 3.8 million unit shortage of houses across the country today. And that's just, again, today. Mm. So, you know, as we move further and further away from today, that number should continue growing. And so we do have to start thinking about what are alternative ways to provide housing to millennials, Gen Zers, Gen Alpha, and then even the boomers who are aging out of their big houses and they want to find a smaller home to live in, but they're debating, like, do I give up this 3.5 interest rate and find a more expensive home or do I just stay where I am? So we do need alternative solutions. One challenge that's also driving up those prices is that lack of supply. If you're millions of homes short, You know, and in the city of Detroit, there are homes, but there is sometimes the question of homes that are ready to move into. Mm -hmm. Because as much as you see the HGTV shows and all the other stuff, what realtors tell me is that most people want a place where they have minimal projects. They don't want to do a full home rehab, those kind of things, because they're expensive, they're difficult, all all that other stuff. So uh, that increasing supply seems like that would also overall help costs as well. Absolutely. Let's talk about tomorrow's housing innovation showcase and what's happening here, because You're not just building houses. You're trying to enable others to do it. That's right. We affectionately call Tomorrow's Housing Innovation Showcase this, which is fun. Oh, yeah. And let's be honest. Detroit loves their acronyms. Yes, yes, we do. (laughs) So actually, North Corktown Neighborhood Association, working with Trisha Talley and her team and uh, the board over there, we're working on displaying permanently up to nine houses in the North Corktown neighborhood that will be built from a factory. These would be homes that are constructed year round in factories around the country and uh, will be placed on a permanent parcel in North Corktown. And then North Corktown is also putting a community land trust together to keep these homes affordable so that in the future, if residents who own these homes in the first showcase decide to move, the next resident will have that same affordable, accessible uh, opportunity. What does the community land trust do to help make that happen? There are a lot of residents that have lived and benefited from the more than a billion dollar of equity that most Detroiters have gained over the years in their home values. And so you don't want to disrupt the private market. And so in North Corktown, there's a single starter home is starting at about $400,000. I've seen some homes come on the market for up to $800,000. And again, you don't want to disrupt the equity that a lot of those homeowners already have. And so what a community land trust will do is it separates the land from the structure. And so when a resident shows up to buy that home, they're buying the structure and they're leasing that land, which makes the home affordable to acquire. So you don't know the definitive 
percentage breakdown between the land and structure yet because everything's not stood up and we're still waiting on the community to in inform the design and which houses will be built there. But that essentially will show up as a very discounted property compared to what's on the private market. So you might have a home, as an example, uh, a home that will list through a community land trust at $200,000 while the private market is still performing at $400,000 and up. But it doesn't disrupt the market at all because it is in the CLT. The mm -hmm. land value still holds its value. And manufacturing homes offsite and bringing them in brings a lot of value, doesn't it? I, I can't help but think about the Sears homes, yeah. the Sears kits, yeah. and everybody now adores, right? Like yeah. you see on Instagram, whatever, oh, this is Sears kit, whatever, whatever. I don't know. This is a hint that my Instagram is full of uh, <laughs> old house architecture and dogs. Yeah. But uh, that is a concept that's not new, but there are some stigmas around manufactured homes too that people have. That's right. That's one of the goals of the, of the showcase is to make sure that not only residents, but policymakers, elected officials, developers, other nonprofits, anyone who is interested in understanding the new technology that exists in housing has the opportunity to come to the showcase and walk and see these homes. North Corktown already has factory built housing in its neighborhood today. And I remember turning around and looking at a home, I wanna say it's on 12th Street actually, a colonial, looks like a standard brick colonial but we found out that it's actually a modular home that was built in the early 2000s. These are not mobile homes, the traditional mobile home that we all have come to learn. These are beautifully built, high efficient homes, uh, energy efficient, and they're built to look and feel just like a normal home and if not better looking, they're very modern and sleek as well. Hmm. And the other thing that I love about these houses are that they come already pre-built interior, the interior. So you're delivering a home, the kitchen fully built out, appliances are already in place. All North Cork Town will be doing is taking these houses and doing the exterior work, you know, any siding that's needed, opening the roof up and closing it on top of itself. But these are homes that perform just like a standard home. With a different system like this community land trust, and you're saying you're separating the structure from the land, how is financing going to work around that? Because I only mention that because I, I used to be a member of a co-op and that's a different route. That is a different route. Where then, then something else. Are there any changes in how you would get a mortgage for something like this? That's a great question. We are currently exploring all of those options right now. We have had some conversations with local banks and some even national firms to ensure that the path towards a mortgage does exist and, and can happen. So that product does exist in Michigan already. So I'm not really concerned about a resident not being able to obtain a mortgage for these homes. Let's talk a little bit about who is participating in the program. What were your criteria for selecting the creators of these homes and how many are going to be participating? North Cork Town has put out an RFP soliciting manufacturers. We also met some manufacturers at the Innovation Housing Showcase out in Washington, D.C. that HUD puts on every other year. So this is an off year for them, but next year they'll bring it back. Basically, they compiled a list and just sent it out asking if anyone is interested. But the neighborhood residents are really who's going to decide who participates in the housing showcase. It doesn't matter if there's a, a company out of Texas that has a great product. If the residents don't think that it's a good fit for their community, then that manufacturer won't participate. So we really don't know yet who is going to be participating in the showcase. The residents will help inform that at their March meeting. Is there a target price for these at this point? Again, those are great questions. And North Corktown has been soliciting feedback from its residents to understand, okay. like, what's the right price? Point? Or as a percentage of the market or something like right, that. Right. Okay. What about scalability? Has there been any thought beyond just North Corktown, or are you not there yet? Are there other examples of this land trust model that people can take a look at? Recently had a conversation with the Detroit Justice Center and learned that there are not any specific land trusts that have housing like this that can be pointed to in the city of Detroit. Mm. So this would be essentially the first of its kind in the city as well, and what can act as a model to other neighborhoods that are feeling the pressures of rising costs. Do we have an idea of kind of the square footage and amenities of these houses, like kind of a, a general range, or is that still in the community process? That's still in the community process. But of course, being, in, <laughs> being a Michigander, I would love to make sure that there is a garage mm -hmm. <laughs> for each home. So no uh, specifics yet on amenities for each home. 
One thing that we are working towards, though, is exploring what an accessory dwelling unit can look like. Mm. So these are also built in factories and delivered to site and yeah. stood up. Think of the Indian village or the Boston Edison who have the carriage homes behind the main home. A lot of ADUs today are built with loft style where there's a garage underneath it and then there's an upstairs. I was just in Columbus, Ohio, and that's exactly all through German Village and a number of neighborhoods. And the homes are actually smaller than what you would see in uh, Indian Village or Boston Edison, but they can a lot of them have converted the second level of their garage yeah. or the whole garage and mm -hmm. it just leaves... They just leave the garage doors, but they make them on the outside so it fits the neighborhood. But on the inside, it's like a proper wall. It's interesting to see that. And it also increases density. And that population density can increase services. Because mm -hmm. if there's one thing interviewing businesses and the like that I have found is that there is a general frustration that you can't deploy as many services because of the population density challenges in a number of areas. And as somebody who lived in North Corktown, I am familiar with that mm -hmm. because it's really, I mean, it's fun to have like the urban farm nearby and there's those lots. But if you're thinking about it from a business perspective, that's only so many pizzas you can deliver and <laughs> pheasants don't have credit cards. That's right. They don't. Not yet, at least. Maybe in the metaverse. But <laughs> <laughs> Paging Mark Zuckerberg. Yeah, literally. But uh, that's exactly right. It does add density. It also allows for multi-generations to mm. dwell on one parcel together. There are a lot of young people who are still at home but would rather have their space or vice versa where mom and dad are aging out of their home and they need a place to go and this could be an opportunity to have them at, on the same parcel with you. Or childcare. Or a child. Think about the mm -hmm. idea of like, oh, mom and dad, they're not in the same house because listen, mom and dad in the same house, I got a lot of friends to deal with that. That's journey, yeah. right? That's a journey and that's probably good for TikTok. But, uh, <laughs> but giving a little bit of space, there's the yard there, there's something and you know, they can have their house their way and- that is such an important piece of independence. That's right. You know, it's one thing if everybody's on top of each other and you have to figure out what the living room looks like or whatever, it's so much easier to be like, look, mom, here you go. You can have that really ugly electric fireplace. I mean, it's not ugly. It's beautiful. <laughs> you know what I mean? As opposed yeah. to having all of that stuff on top of you or with kids being like, okay, you can go over and hang out with grandma. And then that helps keep down things like childcare costs, which by the way, through the roof. That's right. All kinds of things like that. I, there's so many side benefits to that. To That's me. right. Absolutely. So what's next? And uh, let's talk a little bit about expected timeline. I know that none of this is going to be set in stone whenever you're dealing with multiple layers of process. Uh, things tend to go the way they go. But what is your hope for timelines on this? The hope for timeline is late summer of uh, this year uh, to deliver the entire housing showcase. Really? Wow. From order to delivery... 60 to 90 days, depending on the housing manufacturer, to deliver a home after you've, you've ordered it. And that's part of what keeps the cost down, I assume. That is definitely part of what keeps costs down. And because it's not really a popular method of purchasing homes yet, and this is really why we want to do the showcase, you want people to know the process. Like, this is how you buy a home. This is how you can, you can do this too. It doesn't have to be fully developer focused. You will still need to hire a general contractor to help put things together on the home. But mm. essentially, like a resident could do this too if they wanted. Are there any income restrictions or guidelines around that for this project? We have not explored that yet. Okay. So I don't know yet. Okay. I, those are the kind of questions I just know listeners mm -hmm. will have. Cause Absolutely. Because in my head, I'm kind of like, I kind of like North Corktown. <laughs> well, North Corktown is being very intentional about making sure that its residents have access to these homes first. So okay. folks who are renting in the neighborhood. So maybe a tier system where it's like renters, people nearby, city residents that are like move it up the scale. Yeah. Okay. They're, they're, they're working on something like that. Yes. Okay. Really right. interesting. Really interesting. Mm -hmm. Now, Darnell, this conversation around affordability, attainability, there's a lot of terms in this that – like in the popular conversation, people just swim in them. You know, I remember covering a story about uh, some deeply affordable housing and you know, going to the area of like, hey, if you're below a certain income, you're basically like the government subsidy section eight level versus like affordable versus attainable. Can we kind of like cut through this for this particular project? What is the goal with this particular project? Yeah, the goal for this project is to really provide attainable housing in the North Corktown neighborhood. I think when you look at where prices are today, it's really out of reach for a lot of residents by having accessible, attainable housing for residents that are either renting and been living there or who want to age out and find something else. This is the kind of housing that they would be looking to move towards. 
So something that's in the line of, I'm already paying rent. I've got a job. I've got the ability to pay, but uh, I can't drop seven hundred thousand dollars. <laughs> that's right. That's, that's exactly right. That's exactly right. Do you think this is something that could be scaled? I think it has to be explored. I think we it, it should be uh, something because there's a scaled. lot of room in Detroit. That's true. And in neighborhoods, there are I like to call uh, it the missing teeth. You mm-hmm. have a couple of vacant lots in neighborhoods that would do well with another house there. And this could be an alternative solution to fill in those those missing teeth in some of the more dense communities that already exist. Well, and that is something that bedevils a lot of developers where it's like, hey, I want to do this big project, but I can't get a hold of three parcels of land or, you know, some deal has to be done to make it happen over like with the Stellantis plant or any of that kind of stuff. If you can build on a scale that's more human, Mm -hmm. then you can start to deploy things and start to create some momentum Mm -hmm. without all of the the things that get held up. Because I know, and the mayor will talk about it, Mayor Mike Duggan will talk about speculators and such grabbing specific key properties to try to stop things. If it's something where, hey, I got a plot of land, I can make something like this happen. You know, I even think about other things to learn from this with the idea of, you know, in my neighborhood, I could pick up a lot for twenty or thirty thousand dollars. But the process to build a house, I have been told it's gonna be five hundred thousand dollars to start. And I've learned that the city has its own things of not knowing as well how to handle single family construction. So I feel like there's so many other things we could learn from this and Mm -hmm. muscles we could flex Mm -hmm. with the idea of, hey, could there be an on-ramp program for I want to be somebody who invests in my neighborhood and builds a place along these levels, but I don't have $500,000. I could swing a more average kind of number. Right. Yeah, because I was stunned to learn some of the costs and things with with that when you're just trying to roll your own house. Mm -hmm. Yeah, especially knowing that you're not dealing with the same issues with on-site build. So you're not, you know, losing lumber. Your lumber is not getting damaged in the weather. Tools aren't going missing. There's a template for process. I think about That's inspectors. Right. I think right. about utility contractors. That's right. There's something that can be like, oh, it's this thing. Mm-hmm. I understand it and I can do it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You know, and that kind of muscle, I think, is very important. I agree. From a scalability perspective, you know, I think one thing that I would love to see is if one of these manufacturers said, Listen, if there's space in Detroit, we would love to come and provide jobs and a factory here in the city. Mm. And I think that that could go a long way. You know, have homes being built year round, delivered locally and outside of the city of Detroit. I mean, we have a a national housing crisis and we need more factories to be building more houses. Wouldn't it be amazing, you know, you've ever seen like the Made in NYC badge, but built in Detroit right in the cornerstone. Wouldn't that be something amazing to be like, I know where this house came from. That's right. That's right. Detroit put the world on wheels and we can put, you know, houses all over the world too. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I really appreciate your time on this. Darnell Adams, the vice president, Detroit Community Initiatives at the Gilbert Foundation. If people want to know more, what can they do? I would say for North Corktown residents, stay engaged with the North Corktown Neighborhood Association. That would probably be the best way to stay in contact with what's going on with the project. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you so much for your time on Daily Detroit. I appreciate you. Thank you for having me. All right, if you've got thoughts, dailydetroit at gmail.com or 313-789-3211. Leave a voicemail. Would love to hear from you. I am Jer Stays. Thank you so much for listening to your Daily Detroit. Remember that you are somebody, and we'll talk tomorrow.